Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 397 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by former heavyweight world title challenger, the main man himself, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing, my man? How you doing this week? I'm good, my man. How about you? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. You know the drill by now. Um, yeah, let's dive straight into the review part of the show. Obviously, there's quite a bit to go over, so let's waste no time and jump straight into that as quick as we can. Uh, the preview part, obviously, I think is going to be slightly lengthy as well. So let's let's get straight to business here. We're going to start with a card that took place at the Free Arena in Dublin, Ireland. Um, yeah, it was a big card, obviously. It was a major card headlined by two of the best female fighters in the world. We're going to get to that. But let's start with the undercard firstly. Um going to touch on a couple of the fights here. Paddy Donovan with a win over Sam Mason. He's now 11-0. and A TKO in round six there. O'Mason's corner through the towel in. Um, yeah, I don't think O'Mason had tons of notice for the fight, but a good win for Paddy Donovan. Also on the card as well. I was a little bit surprised by this, but Tommy... Uh, I was going to say Tommy. I think he goes by Thomas. Thomas Carty now 6-0 and with five KOs. A knockout in just the second round against Jay McFarlane, who's now 14-8. and um, quite disappointed really with McFarlane because I expected this one to go long and po- possibly even see it go the distance. Tommy Carty, Thomas Carty was um, just over two to one for the win on, on, on points there. But yeah, got him out in two rounds. I don't really think McFarlane was necessarily hurt, even though he'd been down twice in the fight. But I didn't think he was, he, he'd necessarily... I think, was it round two or round three? I'm not entirely sure now, actually, what, what round he got stopped in. But anyways, um, I think he'd been down two or three times. But he didn't really seem massively hurt. You know, he wasn't really thrown back, though, at the time when the referee jumped in. So I don't really blame the referee. But it was just so disappointing for Jay McFarlane, you know. Really tough guy normally. Seven losses, only one by KO. I expected it to go the distance. Thomas Carty, you know, doesn't have tons of experience. I thought we'd be able to lean all over him and maybe get him, you know, get him to go the distance. But anyways, a good win for Thomas Carty. Take nothing away from him. Um, exciting future, I think, actually, for him. And it's good to see, you know, an Irish heavyweight. I don't really think they come around too often. An Irish heavyweight with a bit of promise. Um, one other thing I will say. Jay McFarlane, I mean, God almighty. Obviously... Matchroom supporters and I guess just boxing people in general, or whatever. If you follow the social media, you know, channels and stuff, quite often when there's a fight card that Matchroom put on that they're doing in like a big city, you know, like they've gone to Dublin here, they they might go to Cardiff. They do a 5k run on the on the morning of the fight night, you know. So Eddie Hearn will put out the meeting point on on social media and fans are allowed to turn up and go on a 5k run with you know Eddie Hearn some of his staff and Jay McFarlane turned up for the run so he did 5k the the morning of his fight here against Thomas Carty and obviously you know Jay McFarlane weighs 283 pounds as soon as I saw that he turned up for that run in the morning, I thought, what is this guy doing? He's, he's not going to have anything when it comes to the evening. What the heck is he doing? And that is what happened. He obviously gave everything to the 5K run. He had nothing on fight night. I, I just don't understand what's going on. It's common sense. Anyway, moving up the card, Kivon Agiarko now 13-0. and A unanimous decision for him over 10 rounds against Grant Dennis, who's now 18-5. and Um... Again, Agiarko was coming off, um, I think, his career longest layoff. It was really like a sparring session. And I really am a believer in the fact that you perhaps shouldn't ever face your sparring partners in a real fight. Because that is, 
Um, yeah, that is that is how it can look on, on Saturday night there. Agiaco, like I say, pretty much won every round, dominated Grant Dennis, but it wasn't really anything um, exciting. You know, it was just it was just pretty much uh, you know one sided, very boring. Agiaco's you know took a lot of stick before in the past with you know boring fights not really looking good not really stepping his foot on the gas too much and you know just kind of cruising through the rounds and that was pretty much more of what we saw there it's not really the performance that's gonna you know get you off your seat it was one of the boring fights of the card if I may say so moving now to another one this was a real shock upset here friend of the show Gary Cully now 16 and 1 TKO'd in round 3 against Jose Felix who's now 40 and 6 with a draw. Jose Felix, I was talking about it last week. You look through his 39 wins, they were all really against unknown opposition. And the only real names that you could recognize on his resume were guys that he'd lost to. You know, he had a bunch of fights. He's only 31 years of age, but what a way to pick up win number 40 to knock out Gary Cully in Ireland as well. I I just cannot I still cannot believe what I saw. Gary Cully was a huge, huge favourite going in. He was like a 1-33 to favourite. God knows what the odds were on the Mexican to pull off the upset. But Mexicans keep coming to Britain and Ireland and, and doing this kind of thing. But I tell you what, no one saw this one coming. People were expecting Gary Cully to get him out there in one or two rounds. I thought it would go a few rounds. I, um, I went with the... the the over, which was only 3.5. I said, I think on last week's show, 3.5. To go over 3.5 rounds, I felt was a decent bet to double your money. Well, obviously, it only went three rounds, so that one just narrowly missed out that, that bet there, a narrow loser. Um, yeah, Gary Cully down twice in the third round in his corner through the towel in. Just absolutely shocking, you know. Um, the Mexican was game, obviously, you know. He obviously came to give it a good go. The first two rounds, I think, were quite close rounds, really. The Mexican landed some good shots, but in that third round, he caught Cully. I can't remember what shot it was now, but he caught him. You know, Gary Cully was was leaning forward. His chin was left out to dry. Boom, right on the chin. I think he, yeah, he threw his own shot and left his own chin out there and smack right on the chin. Um, was in tons of trouble, but his initial reaction was to hold and he held him I think um if I'm not mistaken the referee got between and maybe broke him up Gary Cully seemed like he had his wits about him instantly and I thought okay maybe he's okay maybe he's okay he, he he did a hell of a lot of holding over the next 30 seconds or so and I thought he's he's really in control of what's going on here seems like he's you know his mind's right and um doing the smart thing and then he seemed to come back a bit and he landed a few good shots himself and I thought okay he's he's back to it now he doesn't need to win this round he's lost the round already but you know he's back to it and he started coming forward again looking good again and um, yeah he gets caught again and um, I think again and that's when he was down again and he was all over the place and you know the 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 fans on Twitter and stuff are criticizing the referee um, yeah I understand why, but I also understand why a referee wouldn't jump in um, and stop it in any way prematurely. He has tried to give Gary Cully in Ireland this this massive prospect in Irish boxing. This guy was, you know, tipped to be a world champion. He's been uh, annihilating everyone he's been facing recently. And um, they're going to give him absolutely every chance to continue unless, unless he is out cold on the canvas I understand that's part of the game you know we 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 know that that's part of the game we see sometimes in boxing you know premature stoppages and they really really you know annoy us all and um sometimes we see a really late stoppage like this but I can completely understand you know like they're gonna give him every chance in Ireland that's just how it's gonna be if this happened anywhere else in the world we'd have seen a stoppage a bit quicker but, you know, he got the stoppage in the end, the Mexican. He upsets the odds incredibly. And Gary Cully loses. But, yeah, they gave him absolutely every chance. And I'm not too mad at that because I, I, I know the game. So, you know, it is what it is. Moving up the card once again, Dennis Hogan, 31-5 and five now with a draw. He lost unanimously to James Metcalf, now 25-2. and two. Um, 
It was for Hogan's IBO World Super Welterweight title, which I think he took away from Sam Eggington. Um, he looked really quite poor, actually, Dennis Hogan, even early on. I thought this fight would always go the distance, and I wasn't entirely confident after about three or four rounds, because James Metcalf was absolutely dominating Hogan. Um, Hogan did have a point deducted in round 12 for repeatedly losing his gum shield, but it really didn't matter at that stage. He toughed it out, man. He really did. He showed a big set of balls and a massive heart. And Dennis Hogan really kind of disappointed me from his last performance against uh, Sam Eggington. I thought he boxed quite well there. But yeah, he couldn't deal with James Metcalf, who, for me, might be a cleaner boxer than Eggington, but certainly doesn't put the same kind of pressure on and probably doesn't punch as hard. So I was quite surprised with how one-sided the fight was in the end. And then, yeah, moving to the main event, Chantel Cameron now 18-0. and 0. She is still the undisputed super lightweight female world champion a majority decision over 10 two minute rounds against katie taylor who loses her oh she's now 22 and one um obviously like i say chantel upsets the odds again um i said this a long time ago that i felt she would beat katie i said it years ago um really really happy for chantel to have to have done that um, I think it was a really, 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 really close fight, though. I actually had it a lot closer than a lot of people did. Um, yeah, I I'm just going to really whiz through these rounds here. But yeah, round one I gave to Chantel. I felt that Katie was just fighting in bursts. You know, quick combinations that look flashy, but no real power behind them. Um, Cameron, as well, was completely on the front foot for the entire round, landing powerful jabs, which I think ended up being probably the best punch that she threw all night long. Her, her jab was powerful, ramrod, and um, it worked a hell of a lot. She was she was scoring with that. And yeah, she landed a few backhands as well in round one. Um, definitely a Cameron round, but it wasn't that she dominated it heavily or anything. It was a close round. Um, round two, again, another competitive one. I felt Taylor boxed quite well, you know, while backpedaling. She also showed good head movement as well forcing Cameron to miss a lot uh, Cameron's still coming forward though and having a bit of success round three um, I gave to Katie Taylor I felt that she probably bossed about 70% of the round um, they did show the punch stats during round three and Cameron had thrown over double that of the shots of Taylor um Taylor threw 50 shots, Cameron threw over 100, Taylor had landed 18, Cameron had landed 21. Um, round four was a big round, by the way, for Chantel Cameron. She really brought the fight to Taylor. Um, Cameron, again, was showing her, her strength, her size, the power advantage I felt she had. And Taylor was unable to get into a rhythm. Um, Cameron's jab was playing a huge part in that round as well, like I say, accurate, heavy, solid. Round five I gave to Katie Taylor. It was a scrappy round. Katie's hair was all over the place. It came under done on one side, it kept getting in her eyes, um, Chantel though was, was I felt unable to capitalise, you know, cleanly anyway, Katie was timing her counters nicely, Cameron walked into a few of them, um, it was a scrappy and close round, round six, uh, again, the fight I felt caught light, that round even more than previous rounds, there were a few times where both the girls would just meet in the middle of the ring and slug it out, both girls were having six, um, similar success with their combinations like they were hitting each other like you know you hit me three times I hit you three times but I felt Cameron had a little bit more on her shots I gave her the round um Round seven, another another big round for, for Chantel Cameron. Taylor was looking a little bit overwhelmed. I expected Taylor probably to, to close the fight the stronger of the two. Just because of her fitness and her conditioning, it's always been quite on point. And Cameron, last time out, obviously, didn't look fantastic in the late rounds against Jessica McCaskill. But then I, I remember, you know, that did happen in Dubai against a pressure fighter in McCaskill. Whereas Taylor has looked fit against girls who weren't as big or as strong as Chantel Cameron. Um, so I thought, oh, maybe that's why Cameron looks really good in round seven and Katie doesn't. But then I think Katie did kind of finish quite strong, by the way, in the next few rounds. Um, again, we saw the punch that's shown in round eight. 410 punches from Cameron to 203 of Taylor. Um which was mad, you know, she's still doubling the amount that um, Katie had thrown, that was crazy, um, Taylor for me edged round eight, um, yeah, Cameron's face was beginning to swell as well, Katie was boxing quite smart, again, timing her combinations well, making Cameron miss a lot, um, and yeah, round nine, um, I felt Taylor might have just about nicked it, it was a really close round, it could have gone either way, um, at that point, I looked at the in-play odds, and Katie Taylor was 13-2 to to win in play. 
So just over, what's that? Yeah, six times your money and your stake back. Um, and that was in round nine. So only one round left. And then, yeah, round 10, I actually felt Katie, you know, closed the round quite strongly. Um, Cameron was a little bit desperate, no real composure. It should have been Katie following Cameron around the ring, you know, because Katie should have been the desperate one to win that round, I felt. But instead, Cameron was trying too hard to land shots. And yeah, I understood. You know, she probably thought, oh, I am in Ireland and I do need to win this round as well. But no, I think she lost the round. But obviously, yeah. Um, yeah, Katie loses the fight. Um, I can't remember what the scorecards individually were now, but I think the right girl won. And I'm really, really happy for Chantel because I believed in her, you know, a long, long time ago. And, um, you know, before most people knew her name, to be completely honest with you. So, yeah, really happy to see that she's done what I thought she could have done years ago. But anyway, moving out now to the MGM Grand Las Vegas, Nevada. Let's start with the undercard. Let's run through this. Emiliano Vargas, now 5-0, and a knockout in round two against Rafael Jasso. Now 3-1, and one, he loses his O. Oscar Valdez, now 31-1, and one, a really pointless, unanimous decision over 10 rounds against Adam Lopez, who's now... Uh, 16 and 5. I expected that to happen. I almost tripled my money on Valdez to win on points. Um, yeah, for some reason, they didn't expect him to. Obviously, the first fight that they had was a mad fight where they were both down on the canvas. And it's just a fight that makes absolutely no sense. And Oscar Valdez, you know, his face didn't look great after the fight. He puts another 10 rounds of mileage on his clock. I just don't understand what they're doing with him. Uh, Nico Ali Walsh as well. He's now 8-0 and with a draw. A split draw over eight rounds against Danny Rosenberger. Who's now 13-9 and with five draws. Um, looking at Danny Rosenberger's form going in, I was like, whoa, this is a massive step up here for Nico Ali Walsh. Danny Rosenberger have beaten some decent fighters, you know, with decent, I, I should say, I shouldn't say decent fighters, I should say he beaten some fighters with decent looking resumes or records, you know, in terms of, you know, wins and stuff. And um, I thought to myself, this is a big, big step up. Obviously, Danny Rosenberger as well, quite durable. Um, I expected Nico Ali Walsh to win on points, or I expected Danny Rosenberger to win on points. I really thought it would definitely go the distance. It did, but of course, neither of them won. It ended ended up being a split draw. Danny Rosenberger, I, I, I tip, I, I didn't tip it, but I said it on on Twitter. Um, I put out a little tweet. Um, I think it was on. Friday or Saturday of last week, and I just I just um, mentioned a few good value, you know, boxing betting tips, and um, one of them was actually uh, Rosenberger to win this fight here, and he was thirteen to one to win by any method. He ended up getting a draw, so that one was very close to coming in. Ali Walsh to win on points was six to five, but of course the draw ended up happening. Um, I did say as well, Chantel Cameron points that was five to two that came in. Um, and yeah, Valdez points as well. I, I tweeted that as well, seven to four. So yeah, um, didn't didn't do too bad. But um, what else did we have on that card there? Um, Raymond Muratala now eighteen and a TKO in round two against Jeremiah Nakafila, the Namibian policeman and pub owner. Um, he's now twenty three and three. It was for the vacant WBO global lightweight title and the vacant North American Boxing Federation lightweight title, the NABF. Um, Quite disappointing, really, from Nakafila. I thought he had a real chance here against Muratella. Nakafila just, I don't think, got going at all. I think it, it was over very quickly. The stoppage was, uh, I don't want to say premature. Um, the referee probably could have gave him a little bit more time, but but yeah. Um, it's a good it's a good statement, really, from Muratella, because no one's done that to Nakafila, obviously. No one, so... Yeah, um, it looks good, and it's another, sadly, it's another chance, really, to bury Nakafila and just say, okay, see you later, go back to Namibia, and, you know, we're not going to call your phone again, what's the point, you're getting banged out in two rounds by Muratala. Some people thought there was smart money on Nakafila, I was one of them, I thought he could, he could, uh, he could win this fight, we had him on the show a few weeks ago, obviously he can punch, he's massive for the weight, big, strong guy, um, but yeah, you know, he, he was run over, really, um, but yeah. I, I I don't know. I don't know. It wasn't a great performance. I, I, I'm a bit confused. He said he went back to Namibia with pride. 
Um, yeah, so I'm not not too sure what to say about that one. Moving up the card once again, Junto Nakatani, now 25 and 0. He's now the new WBO World Super Flyweight Champion. Um, he took on friend of the show, former world champion Andrew Maloney, now 25 and 3. Maloney down in round two, round 11, and round 12. Oh, man, it was sad. It was sad. I really like Andrew, as I'm sure listeners of the show will know. We've had him on a few times. Really likable guy, you know? Really, really respectful, likable guy. Um, and, yeah, I I thought that there's a chance that the fight could go to distance, which was my bet. I didn't really want to go with Maloney to win. He was a massive underdog come fight night. And Nakatani, the odds weren't worth even getting on him, you know. Um, I hadn't seen much of Nakatani, though, in the past. And I've got to say, he was thoroughly impressive. His punch selection was unbelievable. Um, He knew when to throw the right shots and what shots to throw. Um, He really, really impressed me, actually. And I think it's an exciting addition there at Super Flyweight amongst, you know, some of the great fighters that are in and around those weights. Um, So, yeah... I mean, I'd love to see him get in there with Bam Rodriguez, by the way. What a fight that would be. Um, But yeah, I'm really impressed with him. I think he's perhaps maybe a name to consider for the pound-for-pound list very soon. Um, But yeah, um, yeah, sad. Sad to see for Maloney because, yeah, his corner corner at the end of round... He was so brave, by the way, Maloney. He didn't stop trying the entire fight. Like, it was not working. It was not working. His game plan wasn't working. Um... I think the game plan was just to get on the chest of Nakatani and let your hands go on the inside, which he did, you know, successfully a few times. But overall, he was just letting round slide away, slide away. He wasn't doing enough, but he did not stop trying at all until the final punch of the fight. And it's so sad because at the end of round 11, the corner of Maloney was saying, if you get in any trouble at all in this round, I'm throwing the towel in. I don't care if it's the last round, I'm going to throw the towel in. And I was like, wow, man, it's, it's, you know, I'm thinking probably about my bet winning if it goes the distance. So I'm thinking, wow, like we're in the last round. Just, you know, just, just, uh, you know, it's only one round. Don't throw the towel in in the last round, you know. And um, yeah, he goes out there. Uh, they're screaming at him to stay out of trouble. He stays out of trouble. There's 18 seconds left in the 12th round. And yeah, walks right into a shot that put him out it was a brutal knockout and that was that so he gets knocked out in the 12th and final round um he was on the floor you know blood coming out of his face to get knocked out in the very you know in the dying seconds of round 12 i know that's something that obviously you've had to deal with eddie and that brings me on to you actually devin haney now 30 and 0 Unanimous decision, 12 rounds over, Vassal Lomachenko now 17-3, and three. Devin still the undisputed champion at at lightweight, talk to me Eddie. Honestly man, um, <laughs> you know, good performance uh, by both guys to be honest, but I just thought Lomachenko, you know, showed a, showed a high level again, um, you know, getting, getting in it with Devin, Devin is young. He's sharp. Most people, you know, figured Devin to to be the winner, but I knew I knew a little better than that. You know what I mean? But and he actually he actually did turn out to win. It's just uh, it's an unfortunate situation. I understand the politics of it and why, uh, because I honestly thought Lomachenko won, but I do understand the politics of it and why Devin won and why uh, they would give him the nod uh, in that fight. And uh, you know, he's twenty four. There's, uh, there's history with the other two guys that are, you know, one of, one of the other two guys, maybe both, um, with sparring and just, uh, you know, uh, history in general with them and who's the best. And so the fights are easy, fights are easier to sell with those guys. Lomachenko's 35. He's, you know, you would figure closer to retirement, you know what I mean? And it just, it kind of, it, it kind of sucks for him. And you've seen his emotion after the fight, after, you know, he went to the locker room. It's just he realizes that the chances of him getting into that position and becoming undisputed is highly unlikely. It's just because of, you know, the politics of boxing. He was, you know, benefited, I guess, with, you know, having such a great amateur background coming into the to the, to the division, to, I mean, to, to, to professional boxing, being able to fight at such a high level so fast, but now sees, sees it as a negative. Um, 
you know, looking at this young guy who's, who's going to get the nod in a situation where he probably should have won. Um, like I said, it was just some of these rounds were really difficult to score. So to say it was a robbery, I don't know about the robbery, but, um, you know, with, with experience and watching fights and being a part of it, some of the stuff like that, the 116-112 card was just ridiculous to me. There's no way I could see that um, at all, especially he, him, him giving one of the rounds to Haney that I thought was – the clearest one, probably one of, one of, or if not the clearest round to give to Lomachenko. And it just shows that there's certain, you know, certain agendas and things like that. I mean, he probably looked at the cards or realized that he, or, or maybe didn't remember <laughs> that there was a round that he gave to Lomachenko early on that he didn't want to give. To. It's just, it just looks to me, looks bad. You know what I mean? There has to be an explanation for it, but we could say, talk about this forever none of this is ever going to be brought to attention um, really because then it would bring in too much stuff in the past that would have to be brought up. And, you know, other people will come and say, well, why wasn't my cards reviewed? Like why wasn't my Tomas Adamic cards reviewed? And why wasn't this a big deal and blah, blah, blah. But um, yeah, it's just, it's just an unfortunate situation, but the fight was close enough to where this was a possibility. And I kind of knew that it might be that close because I didn't think either guy would stop the other. I thought maybe if anybody had a chance, it would be um, Lomachenko to stop Haney late, which it actually looked like that was going to come true. At certain points, you know, you saw Haney kind of, you know, succumb a little bit. But, um, you know, he's a tough kid. He fought through the adversity, got to the end, and he actually didn't do too bad in the 12th. I thought the 12th was probably closer to Lomachenko maybe, but he just didn't put the effort that I thought he was going to put into that last 12th round, to that last round, which if I think if he did, he might have got a majority draw. I think if that would have been. If, if, well, I don't know. It depends on what the cards of the judges were. But anyway, um, good fight all around. Um, there were some good things that Haney did, Great, some great things that uh, Lomachenko did. I thought I thought Loma won, but, ah, you know, man, it's hard with boxing, man. This is, this is boxing, you know. There's nothing you can do about it. All you can do is just hope that you get a better card the next time not saying this was the worst it's, it's boxing yeah no um i'm glad that you highlighted round 10 as well obviously the the uh yeah the scorecard of dave moretti is being obviously criticized on social media but particularly round 10 um i, I just do not understand how you can give round 10 to devin haney but anyway i'm gonna run through what i saw of the fight um I do remember tweeting after about round three or round four on Twitter just saying that this fight is going to be crazy to score. <laughs> and I think that that really came to ring true in the end. Um, round one, I felt, was a feel-out round. Lomachenko obviously doing a lot of fainting. Haney trying to keep the distance, obviously, you know, using his jab. Loma did manage to find a few angles, let his hands go in combinations, but wasn't necess necessarily landing cleanly. But looking sharp, which I like to see, from Lomachenko, particularly after last after the last fight he had, where a lot of people felt he aged overnight. Um, round two, again, was a hard one to score. Lomachenko, I loved how he'd just take half a step back and make Haney fall short with his body shots, you know, because when you fall short with a body shot, it does not look good at all. And you look like you're in a position to get countered with an uppercut. He didn't necessarily counter him with an uppercut, but he made him, you know, fall forward like that. And it didn't look good, and it was just half the step back that he did. He's such a great measure of distance. Um, his feet look great as well, Lomachenko. That mental pressure as well that he puts on when he's on the front foot, even if he's not necessarily throwing shots. You know, he constantly makes fighters second-guess themselves and become hesitant. And Haney um, was having, you know, a bit of success, I felt, with his jab. Um, but yeah, you know, I felt that Lomachenko was beginning to as you said on last week's show, download the data. Um, round three, a, another really close round. Um, uh, it was a really close one, round three. I've put here, I just cannot split the two. Um, really exciting fight. Not just the chess match that we all expected. It was an exciting chess match, if that's even a thing. Can a, can a chess match be exciting i don't know enough about chess to say so but it was an exciting chess match round four i gave to lomachenko but i felt it was a close one round five i gave to lomachenko it was another super close one um loma again with the foot feints you know haney using his size both men clearly 
you could see had a lot of respect for one another. Um, and yeah, I thought, you know, after the first five slash six rounds, I felt Lomachenko would probably take over late on and, you know, and turn the fight his way. Because I felt it was quite even after the first kind of five or six. Round six was really close. I think I might have edged it to Haney. Uh, round seven and eight I gave to Loma. Round nine I gave to Haney. Round ten obviously to Loma. Round eleven was a massive round for Loma. He gave Devin a schooling in that round, and I think that was the moment, Eddie, where you probably said it looked like maybe he could even get a stoppage soon. You know, he couldn't miss. He kept rocking Devin's uh, head back with every shot. Algieri on commentary said he can see a stoppage if it carried on as well. Um, yeah, Loma was dominating the fight at that point, and I felt Devin had become just outside of the ring, but really ignorant in recent times. And I like Devin, you know, he's a friend of the show, but yeah, um, it, it just, it kind of clicked to me in that moment, in that 11th round, where the crowd were going crazy because Lomachenko was having so much success. And it's not just me who thinks Devin's turned into a bit of a villain, you know, for no real reason, you know. Um, I think he's become real ignorant, and, and like I say, he was being booed, and all I could hear was Loma, 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 and it's crazy to think that this fight was obviously in America, Loma isn't even from the same continent, you know, like, I, I could never imagine that happening in the UK, you know, like a guy coming over here to beat a UK fighter, and everyone in the whole arena cheering for the, for the foreigner, you know, um, so yeah, I think a lot of the fans have turned against Haney, and I'm not entirely sure how accurate this is, but Dan Raphael tweeted saying that he thinks that um, the DAZN buys, the pay-per-view buys, uh, are at about 150,000, which is extremely low. Um, so yeah, that would that would kind of speak volumes as well about the, the uh, market value of Devin Haney. Um, but yeah, getting back to the actual fight, round 12, I felt Haney nicked to the 12th round for sure. I think a lot of people agree on that. He closed the fight quite well, but what a fight. Um, and I wrote here as well, it doesn't get more high level than this. And um, I think it was a fantastic fight. I think it was close. Um, I'm not entirely sure what else to say of it, really. I thought Lomachenko definitely won it. Definitely. Like... I thought it was close, but I thought he would get it as well. There was three judges there. The crowd were going wild for Lomachenko. He had the flashier work, the cleaner work, and I thought he would get the decision. To see that he ended up losing uh, unanimously was pretty unexpected. Um, don't really want to touch on too much, really. I don't want to go too far into this because I don't want to take up too much time here. But Haney, I'd like to see the rematch really for both guys. Lomachenko was obviously devastated afterwards and it reminded me a little bit of Tyson Fury when he boxed Wilder the first time and he got the draw and he was just devastated. It's like, how can you pick yourself up, go back to the gym, put in the same amount of work that you did because you need to put put in even more work next time around if you're going to actually secure a victory. Because you've seen that when you win clearly in your mind and in everyone else's mind, you still might not get the decision. So to pick yourself back up with the the, the probably the depression that he's going to get from this mildly um, or or, ma or majorly, he's gonna he's gonna have to pick himself back up, go back to the gym, work twice as hard as he did for that last camp in order to hopefully win a decision next time. It takes a lot. It takes a lot. Tyson Fury did it, and I, I just, wow, I take my hat off to him. That second Wilder fight, unbelievable. But yeah, can Lomachenko do that at his age now? I don't know. Um, yeah, I think a rematch needs to happen, though. That's that's what I think is the right thing to do, but I don't know. I'm not entirely sure how I'd see that second one playing out. Um, moving out now to the final card to mention of the review part. It took place at the Margaret Court Arena in Melbourne, Australia. It took place just yesterday. Uh, we saw on the undercard Nikita Sue, now 6-0. and He was able to knock out in round one Benjamin Bomber, who's now 5-1. and He loses his O. And then in the main event, former WBO heavyweight world champion, friend of the show, Joseph Parker, with a first round TKO win against Fega Opelu. Joseph Parker's now 32 and 3. Apelu's now 15 and 4 with two draws. A completely meaningless fight, which I thought was for the Commonwealth heavyweight title. But in the end, I'm not entirely sure it even was for a belt. Don't know what that was all about. But anyway, massive step back there for Joseph Parker. But anyway, that wraps up the review part of the show. It's now time to welcome this week's special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the reigning WBC super lightweight world champion. It is, of course... Mr. Regis Progray. Regis, welcome back on the show, my man. 
Oh, man, thanks for having me, bro. Hey, it's Thanks, always man. a pleasure having you on, Regis. Um, so, Regis, we, 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 we last spoke back in November of last year. So, yeah, first things first. Um, yeah, that Jose Zapita fight, like I say, we spoke a couple weeks before that. Um, when we last spoke, we spoke as well about how long you'd had to wait to get another title shot. Three whole years. Yep. You finally got the uh-huh. shot. You had the fight. It was a fantastic fight, by the way. Um, just talk me through that fight and what it felt like for you to become a two-time world champion, finally. Oh, bro, it was, I mean, it was just a good feeling. I mean, just because, bro, like, they made me wait for so long. You know, like, that's the thing. Like, that was the crazy thing, bro. I was... I was number one in the world. I was number one seed in the tournament when I fought Josh Taylor. I took a, a, a close loss, and, you know, a lot of people still felt like I won a fight, and it just took me so long, bro. It took me three years to get back, you know. Um, but for me, bro, like, in those three years, I just worked and worked and worked, you know. Um, and I said, man, I'm, I'm going to be a champion again. I had a chance to move up to 47, you know, with the whole Marie Tucker thing. I was supposed to fight him, and um, he ended up <clears> – <throat> we were supposed to fight at a catchweight before. And then um, – then pandemic hit, and then he came back. He was too heavy, so he was like, he won't go to 47. I was like, nah, I'm going to be a world champion again. A lot of people was like, man, you tripping, because it was good money at the time. They were like, man, you tripping, you tripping. But, you know, what I want to tell people, bro, I just believed in myself. I was like, bro, I'm going to be a champion again. I'm going to be a world champion. I'm the best in the – I feel like I'm the best in the world at 140. And I've been feeling that for, for years and years, you know, and uh, finally, you know, I got my chance against Zapata, which is a, a killer. Zapata was a straight killer. And I went out there, and I dominated him from the opening bell, and I got to stop it. So, you know, I'm ecstatic about that, bro. Yeah, I rem- like I said, I remember doing the interview with you, and I was saying, I remember at the time you were kind of talking about Zepeda. You were so confident, and I was like, Zepeda, like, is is a legit top fighter, man. Like, but you were so mm-hmm. confident. You went in there, you did a fantastic job. Um, obviously, that fight was on Marv Nation. Since then, your promotional agreement was a little bit hard to keep track of, but you now have been signed mm-hmm. to Matram. Uh, just talk to me about the link up with Eddie Hearn and how it came about, Reed. I mean, well, first off, you know, um, they had a few. Uh, well, you know, <clears throat> I mean, I think, let me see where to start off at. I mean, I went to a fight, you know, once people find out I was a free agent and all kinds of stuff, a lot of people start, it got real hectic, bro. Like, a lot of people just reaching out. Uh, man, they had people going to promoters, like, talking to promoters for me, people that I didn't even know about, bro. Like, people I didn't even know their names, and they was going to promoters for me, trying to get me signed, which was crazy, you know, because I didn't have a manager and stuff like that. You know, once people find out I didn't have a manager, you know, that's what happened. And so one of the people, you know, they told me about Eddie Hearn. So, you know, Eddie Hearn, had a, he had a fight in San Antonio, and um, I went out there and, you know, met with Eddie, and, you know, he pitched me, and it, it sounded like it was just a real good pitch. Like, Woody, I liked everything he said. You know, everything was real cool. And um, I was like, all right, you know, let's just, you know, I guess we'll keep in touch and stuff like that. And um, and then after that, I end up being a, I was still in a in a contract with the old promoter, so I went, I end up um getting out of that. And then of course people find out about that that I was free. And then you know I met with Eddie, I met with Top Rank, and um, you know, it was just a, it was it was a back and forth, man. It was real close. It, there was real, real. There was like neck and neck, bro. Like every day I would wake up just something different on my mind. Like, I'll wake up, man. All right, I'm going to top rank. And I'll go to sleep, man. I'm going to match him. And it was literally, bro, it was like that, like, every single day for, like, three weeks. I really couldn't make a decision. I was just like, I said, God, please guide me and help me make the right decision. But, you know, one thing is just that gut feeling that you just, you, you can't, it's like you, with the, with the match room thing, bro, it's just like that gut feeling. When you have that gut feeling, you you can't just go away from the gut feeling. And I'm not going to lie, bro, like, you know, a lot of people telling me, man, you should go to top rank. You should do this. You should do that. And I was like, you know, I was I was really torn, but I just had that gut feeling that matching was the best. And um, you know, Eddie, he came meet me, and uh, he came meet me in Houston. We all went out to eat, we went out to dinner and stuff like that right before the the Canelo fight. So he came Monday, and the Canelo fight was Saturday. He came meet me in Houston, and you know, we had a, we had a dinner, and and honestly, like the dinner just wasn't even that good. Like Eddie was just like, uh, maybe it won't happen, maybe it do. And I told him that, you know, the dinner was just like, uh, it was just like. Whatever, you know, and I was still kind of, I think I was still leaning more towards, like, top rank, but then I just had that gut feeling. I was just like, man, Matchroom is, I think Matchroom is the best way to go for me, the best route, and um, I end up, you know, signing with Matchroom, you know, like, just that week. 
Well, there we go, man. It's good to get the backstory. And yeah, like I say, hopefully it is the best move. Time will tell. Um, your first mm-hmm. defense of your WBC title was scheduled to be against Australia's Liam Paro. Obviously, he got injured mm-hmm. in steps. Um, Danielito Zoria. Now, the fight takes place June 17th back home in New Orleans. I'll be honest, yeah. I hadn't heard of Zoria until this fight was announced. Do you know much about mm-hmm. your opponent, Regis? No, bro. I don't know nothing about him either. You know, I mean, he's just a he just a late replacement guy. I was looking forward to fighting, you know, um, Liam Powell, and then he pulled out for the injury. So, you know, it was, you know, they try to find a lot of other guys, and you know, guys were just turning the fight down. You know, so I guess you know Zaria stepped up, and you know that's how that's who I'm fighting now. All I know is he fought Barbosa to like a ten round decision or something like that. He lost, and that I mean, for me, that's the only yeah, that's that's the only thing I actually know about. Him. Yeah, pretty much the same for me. I was going to say, obviously, he's got that sole defeat to Arnold Barboza Jr. Um, the fact that Zaria lost on points to Barboza, does that make you want to go the extra mile and maybe stop Zaria? Well, I mean, I do that anyway. <laughs> you know, I'm um, <laughs> no matter who I fight, bro. That's that's. I mean, I'm not. No matter who I fight, I'm. I, I want to show out. You know, I want to show that I'm. I'm superior over the whole division, not just over, not just over my opponent, but just over. My whole division. I want to show that I'm superior. So, um, yeah, it's it. I just I want to do that anyway. It's not even about a competition between me and Barbosa because I know Barbosa is not on my level. So I'm not worried about that. You know, it's just I, I want to go out there, you know, and perform the best and and prove that I and know just keep proving that I'm the best in the world at 140. And just briefly on Barbosa, obviously um, Rick Marigian, the, the the manager of Barbosa, and obviously the manager of Jose Ramirez. Um, you and him had a back and forth the other day on Twitter. He posted a picture of what he said was your new street sign. The sign said Duck King, um, basically mm-hmm. saying you're ducking his fighters, I'm assuming. Now, before I get a response from you, I I personally try my best as a, as a member of the boxing media to remain impartial and to sit on the fence, but I'm not going to do it here. I don't, I don't like Rick myself because I remember once upon a time he said to me um, that I needed serious mental help just because I picked Taylor to beat Ramirez. Obviously, Taylor did beat Ramirez. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not Rick's biggest fan. Um, yeah, I think he's quite a bitter a bitter man. Would you agree with that, Regis? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, listen, bro. One thing about him, I'm, I can give it to him. He's a good manager. He keeps his fighters on. He wants to get his fighters paid. He don't. He doesn't want to put him in, in there with hard fights. He wants to get him paid the most money for the less oppositions. And that's really, honestly, that's what a manager does. Now he goes on Twitter and doing rants and stuff, bro. I I really think the dude obsessed with me, bro, because it's literally like if you if you just take your time and go on his Twitter page, it's filled with stuff with Regis. Regis Fogler is all on his Twitter page. Like, bro, I'm not even your fighter. Just leave me alone, you know? And basically started a long time ago. Jose, Jose Ramirez has been ducking me for five years. But I've been trying to fight this dude for five years. And, you know, obviously, you know, the, the fight came out with the belt. He just turned it down. Now the whole thing with Barbosa came up. And they know, keep them away from me because I will stop Ramirez and I will stop Barbosa. And I think he knows, like me, bro, when I fight people, I'm going to ruin them. I'm going to ruin the fighters. I'm not just I'm not just going to beat a fighter. I'm going to ruin that fighter. You know, I'm going to. And they know that. You know, he he's a smart guy. He knows about boxing. He knows, listen, Regis Progress could potentially ruin my guy. You know, so they want the most money possible, you know, if that guy's going to get ruined. It might be one of the last fights, or if it's not going to be the last fight, it's going to be, you know, close to the end for him because I'm going to I'm gonna take something out of whoever I fight. And so, um, so anyways, like I said, with that, you know, with, with the whole Barboza thing, um, like Barboza had, listen, bro, Barboza had a chance to fight me for the WBC belt. He was making more than he ever made. Now, I don't know what's posted. They, I know they said some low numbers and stuff. That was bullshit. They offered him more. They probably offered him double than he's ever been paid. And for the WBC belt, and Rick turned that fight down. You know, so it's just like, you know, of course, Rick gets online, talks a lot of shit. It's a bunch of lies and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, bro, we know what the truth is. We know what they offered him. They offered him, you know, pro- probably triple what, he, what he's ever been paid, at least more than double what he's been paid. And uh, and a chance for the WBC. And my whole thing, my whole thing, I always say about that is, if it was me, I would have took that for sure. If if Barbosa was the WBC champion and they offered me double the money I've been paid before, and I fight for the WBC on the month notice or four four or five week notice, I'm taking that fight. And they didn't take it, so you know he can say, you know, I mean, he can get on Twitter and say duck, but I mean, I think the real people know 
you know, they know the real truth. So I don't have to keep going back and forth with Rick Morrigan, bro. I mean, I just, you know, for me, let them sit. Every now and then I get bored, I might get on there and tweet some stuff. But for the most part, bro, I just let them keep talking. Do you think he wishes that he was your manager, Regis? No, of course. Of course. He definitely does. Listen, bro, he, he wrote me in the DMs before, bro. Like, he wrote me before, like, man, you should go to top rank, man. You're a great fighter. He told me, like, you're a great fighter and – you know, and, and, and he put, like, oh, I can manage you for 10% and stuff like that. And like, he wants to – I know he wants to manage me. He feels like I have the potential. He tells me how good of a fight I am. He, he does. He does. He gives me credit. He tells me, man, you're a great fighter, but you need a better manager or better decisions, whatever he says. But, yeah, I think he wishes he – if he probably sees the – he knows the potential in me, and he feels like, man, if he had me, how much he could do for me. I You know, I, I, I feel that – I definitely feel that with him. <laughs> Moving on though, um, I wanted to get your reaction to Haney Lomachenko. Who did you feel won, Regis? I thought Loma won. I definitely thought Loma won. Um, I felt like Loma was doing more in that fight. But one thing, my <clears throat> one of my friends told me, he said, "All right, if it was just Devin Haney and Lomachenko fighting without the belts, then Loma would have won. But did he do enough to beat the champion? Um, you know, if you put it like that." You know, it could it, it could go a different way if you if you kind of put it like that. But I still, for me, bro, I felt like Loma won. Just like most of the most, I think most of the world felt like Loma won the fight. You know, um, I know Devin and his daddy said they don't think it was close and all that stuff. But I think, yeah, for me, bro, I thought that. Um, I thought I thought Loma won the fight. And just, I don't want to go too far uh, into fantasy worlds, but if if Devin were to fight Shakur Stevenson at one three five, who'd you favor there? Shakur, one hundred percent. I think okay. Devin has nothing for Shakur, bro. Nothing. I mean, listen. You know, I think the the boxing world actually knows how good Shakur is. So I, I like at thirty five, I don't see no threat for Shakur. Well, you know what? Maybe Javante Davis could threaten Shakur. You know why? Because he has the power. You know, I don't think. I think skill wise, of course, Shakur is. You know, he's he's outstanding um, skill wise. But what happens when you get hit? And he's going to get hit. You know, and Javante has so much firepower that I feel like he definitely will get hit. So, I mean, I would still favor Shakur if him and Javante fight, but I, I, you know, it, it'll be I, I will I still feel like um I I still feel like um Javante could you know could potentially crack him if if he does land that. But I would still lean more towards Shakur. But Devin and Shakur, bro, I think it's I think it's no way like no way Devin could be Shakur. And coming down to my final two questions for you, Regis. I don't know if you happen to see it at all, but a fantastic women's fight took place a few hours earlier on um, that same night of, uh, of, of of the Saturday. Katie Taylor, Chantel Cameron. Did you catch it at all? I, I ain't watch it. I ain't watch it. I just know Katie Taylor lost. Oh, I didn't watch it though. Right. That's all good. All right. Well, yeah. My last real question for you: One week before your fight, another one of your old rivals, Josh Taylor, boxes Teofimo Lopez, Madison Square Garden. I think it's a really interesting fight. How do you see it playing out, my man? Uh, same thing. I think it's interesting. Both the thing is, it's interesting because both of them have pressure on them. Both of them. I think both of them do have a lot of pressure on them. Both of them look bad in both of their last fights. You know, Josh with you know he been out. He been it been a lot of inactivity for a long time. Him with the with Catterall and then um and then um what's his name Teofimo with um Sandal Mud. He got dropped and stuff like that. You know, so both of them are coming off bad performances. Um, I lean more towards I, I really lean more towards Josh Taylor. I feel like Teofimo has the style, but Josh Taylor is just just significantly bigger than Tio. I think he's, you know, he's a lot bigger than him, and I think he's going to break him down mentally. I think he has, the, like, Tio Fimo has the style. He definitely has the style to beat him, that moving around stuff, but I, I just, I don't think he is going to beat him. But I think he has the style. I just don't think he is going to beat him and stuff like that. And, and I mean, Tio has, you know, it sounds like, it feels like he has, like, mental issues and all that type of stuff. So um, I lean more towards Josh Taylor, but um, it's, still, it's still an intriguing fight because of the pressure that that is behind like you know behind both of them it's a lot of pressure with both of them so i think it still is an intriguing fight but um i, I still lean to more towards jack taylor yeah i'm sure it's gonna be real good for you obviously you get to watch that fight which i'm sure you will and then straight after that 
one week later mm-hmm. you you defend your title um yeah mm-hmm. just finally regis before we let you go if you've got any closing words just to the listeners like i say i always like to give you a chance to sign out with a message and it's always fantastic having you on oh man i just i just want everybody man if you can't you know of course i'm fighting june 17th and i definitely want people to come you know come to the fight and stuff like that if they can't come to new orleans definitely watch the zone boy i think it, it's gonna be a special night this is you know, like I'm the first, you know, first off, I'm the only two-time world champion from this city. I'm in New Orleans right now training, so I, I stay from the city. And I'm the only two-time world champion from here. And, um, you know, it hasn't been a fight like this, you know, from with a champion from here since like 1963, uh, which was Willie Pastrano. So, I mean, you know, I, I feel like it's going to be, a, I definitely feel like it's going to be a good show. Um, a lot of people should show up. You know, we got a lot of guests, like special guests coming on the list and stuff like that already. So, I'm um I'm just excited, bro. I can't you know one thing about about you can't you can't let it you can't soak in a moment and let it get to you, but at the same time you could appreciate it a little bit. So I'm just I mean I'm excited about this, bro. I've been working hard, um just working super hard just to go put a, a show on for my people and you know the main thing is to to show the boxing world I'm you know I'm the best at you know I'm the best at what I do. There we go. You get a chance to to show the boxing world once again. It's always fantastic seeing you fight, Regis. But yeah, like I say, it's always a pleasure speaking with you as well. Thank you for your time. Best of luck in your homecoming, June 17th. And we'll speak sometime afterwards. All right, man. Thanks. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. We're going to start here with this one. Uh, Frank Warren has announced that the Liam Davies and Jason Cunningham fight is set to take place on July 29th in Telford, so a homecoming there for Liam Davies. Um, yeah, this is a fight that was supposed to take place, obviously, a while back. It's been rescheduled, so that's the new date there. Not entirely sure if they've announced much of an undercard on that one just yet, but anyway, it's a fight that I think we've already discussed in the past, and yeah, it's being rescheduled on that new date, July 29th. Uh, this one as well from Top Rank. George Camboso has signed a multi-fight co-promotional agreement with Top Rank. Uh, Top Rank are going to be co-promoting Camboso's fights with uh, Debella Entertainment and Ferocious Promotions, which I think is George's own outfit. So all the best to George there, former world champion, friend of the show. Um... What else do we have? What else do we have? Yeah, Alicia Baumgartner defends her undisputed world titles against Christina Linadartu. That's going to take place in Detroit on July 15th. So a homecoming there for Baumgartner. Obviously, the the, the fight's going to be, um, you know, promoted by Eddie Hearn and Matchroom. It's going to be live on DAZN. On the undercard as well, we're going to see uh, Richardson Hitchens get in there with Montana Love. I think that's fantastic, that fight there. And also, the Cuban Andy Cruz makes his pro debut. Uh, that's a really good card. I actually really, really like that one there. But yeah, Baumgardner gets a chance to avenge her sole defeat, which, of course, was to Linadar to a few fights ago. So all the best to Baumgardner there. What else do we have? What else do we have? Uh, Savannah Marshall, she will now be headlining that card on July the 1st because Liam Smith has decided to pull out for the second time in his rematch here with Chris Eubank Jr. because apparently his injury is not going to be quite 100% by July the 1st. So he's decided to pull out basically to fully recover before penciling in a date, you know. So, um, yeah, it's not a great, it's not a great look to be honest with you because you know the fans are getting messed about obviously they pushed the date back and now on the second date they they, they're cancelling the fight you know altogether so yeah elevated to the main event is savannah marshall uh boxing the undisputed world champion at her weight uh which of course is french on cruz de zern that's the new main event um, in response to this, Boxer, the the promoters of the show, they are saying that everyone who holds a ticket will be given a ten or twenty pound uh, food voucher for for um, for the AO Arena on the night of the fight. So you can turn up there and get your ten or twenty pound food voucher, depending on the the cost of your of your ticket. Um, that's basically what they're trying to do to get people to not seek a refund. So you're going to get a 10 or 20 pound food voucher per ticket and you're also going to get early access and a 10% discount on the tickets when they're released for the rescheduled 
uh, bout between Liam Smith and Chris Eubank Jr. I'm not entirely sure that we're going to see the rematch. It's making me think that they're going to maybe try and make Ben Eubank, because even Eddie Hearn tweeted Ben and Eubank again, I think, the other day when this was announced. So if Liam Smith's not going to be ready, then if we do see the Ben and Eubank fight, it's going to probably be more of a money fight for Eubank. Uh, definitely be more of a money fight for Eubank. And, you know, fans wouldn't even get a chance to buy the tickets for a second rematch here with Liam Smith because it's probably not going to happen. So I wouldn't take the food voucher and the 10%. I'd be getting a refund if it were me, but it's all up to you guys if you hold tickets. But yeah, that's it though for the news part of the show. Moving on now to the preview part. We're going to start here um, in Germany at the Helios Arena in Baden-Württemberg over here couple fights to mention we've got return of return uh, to the ring for former world champion Tyrone Zoiger who's 25 and 1 with a draw that, that sole defeat still to Rocky Fielding all those years ago he's back in a 6 rounder at light heavyweight against Andre Budera who's 18 and 30 with two draws Zoiger um, has had one fight back since taking four years out the ring. This is his second fight back. Also on the card for the BDB International Heavyweight title. It's a 10-rounder here at heavyweight. We've got Daniel Dietz, who me and Eddie used to laugh at because we were saying it's, it's a really ironic surname, Dietz, but he comes in at almost 300 pounds. But anyway, he's actually been banging people out. He's 9-0 with 9 KOs, so I don't think he's a joke anymore. But he gets in with NS Kermizitoprak. He's 12-3. and three. All the best to him against Daniel Dietz. And yeah, the main event, Firat Arslan, 53-9 and nine with three draws. Former world champion. He gets in with Ibrahim Yildirim, who's 11-3. and three. That's over 10 rounds at Cruiser. Moving now to the Tupatemi Air Force Central Stadium in Bangkok, Thailand. Over here, we're going to see Wisak Wangek, a.k.a. the Rodent Eater, a.k.a. Sarisaket Sorungvasai. 51-6 and six with a draw in an eight-rounder against Kongrich Nantapech who's uh, 31 and 6. That's over 8 rounds at Bantamweight. And then annoyingly, we're going to see three cards clashing on Saturday, all in the UK. It's so annoying when this happens, but it is happening. Let's start with this one that goes down at the Vitality Stadium uh, in Bournemouth, Dorset, United Kingdom. It's going to be live on Sky Sports. Let's start with the undercard. I'm going to try and touch on pretty much all the main fights here. Um... Karis Artingstall, 3-0 in a, in a, um, I'm not sure how many rounds it is actually, but she gets in with the undefeated 5-0 Jade Taylor. I'm expecting Karis Artingstall to win that one on points. We're going to see Sam Eggington, 33-8, friend of the show, get in there with Joe Pigford, who's 20-0 with 19 KOs. Um, I remember Joe Pigford years and years ago fighting Aaron Morgan, and it was, oh God, I can't even remember what card it was on now, but anyway... Um, he has just been banging people out again and again and again ever since then. And um, I've always, you know, I've always been quite high on Joe Pigford. But unfortunately, he's been such an under-the-radar type of fighter. He hasn't really had a big chance on TV or anything. And I'm not entirely sure he's going to get on TV again here, which is a bit sad. Because you've got to see Sam Eggington on the TV, surely. But I'm looking at the other fights on the TV here. We've got Karis Artingstall. She's definitely going to be on TV, I would have thought. We've got Tommy Welch, that's the son of Scott Welch. He's 10 and 0. He gets in with Amin Buchetta, who's 7 and 6. That's a six rounder at heavyweight. They had Tommy Welch on, on Sky Sports News just this week. So I'm going to assume that if they've had him on Sky Sports News, they're probably going to want to actually show his fight on Sky Sports. So I'm assuming he'll be getting on. Um. um we're going to see Michael McKinson, 24 and 1, friend of the show, former. former um, I'm not sure if he boxed for a world title, actually. Uh, 24 and 1. He gets in with Lebin Morales, who's 19 and 6 with a draw. That's probably going to wind up not being on TV, Michael McKinson. Uh, we're going to see Lee Cutler, 12 and 1, in a 10 rounder against Stanley Stannard, who's 10 and 0. That's probably not going to make it to TV. And then, yeah, obviously, the main event I'll get to in just a sec a Coley Billum Smith. So I'd say they're going to show the Coley fight on TV. They're going to show the Artingstall fight on TV. They're going to show the Tommy Welch fight on TV. And I'm not entirely sure. I hope Sam Eggington and Joe Pigford get on. But that's a great fight. But back to that, because I was kind of going a bit too far there. Eggington, um, obviously, last time out, I think he picked up a little quick win just on a dinner show uh, back home in Birmingham or whatever, or in Cannock. And um, 
Before that was his loss to Dennis Hogan, where he looked awful. So I'm not entirely sure what he's got left. And if he doesn't have much left, then Joe Pigford is the worst kind of guy to fight because he can bang. And if your feet are not moving, you're going to probably get put to sleep. So I think that's a really, really, really interesting fight. All the best to Sam Eggington. I'd love to see him win. Uh, I really would. It would be massive to take another row at this point in his in his career, even though he's just 29. Feels like he's been around for 20 years. Um, we got on the card as well, like I say, Tommy Welch, I already mentioned it, Mace Rug, who's 8-0, he gets in with Dean Dodge, who's 9-3 and with a draw, I think in Dean Dodge's last fight, he got stopped by Akib Fiaz, who hadn't knocked anyone out apart from Dean Dodge, that's over six rounds at Super Feather. Um, we got Michael McKinson, like I say, and then, yeah, the main event, Lawrence Ciccoli, 19-0, a defense of his WBO World Cruiserweight title against Chris Billum Smith, 17-1, and it's in Billum Smith's backyard of Bournemouth. Um... Really, really good fight. Really, really good fight. Um, obviously, we all know the story. Former former um, gym mates, former sparring partners, former friends. I think still friends, obviously. But um, Lawrence looked awful last time out, let's be completely honest. And it wasn't really long ago. It's been a very, very quick turnaround. I've forgotten how many weeks. It's about five or six weeks or something like that, I think it is. Chris Billam Smith, though. In his last fight, that's when he got that devastating knockout. It was really, I think, one of the best knockouts of last year. It was uh, five months ago now against Armen Zokaj. Um, so, yeah, uh, he's had two fights, I think, since then. But anyway, back on to uh, Billam Smith. Honestly, Billam Smith, I don't ever really think we'll get to world level as such. I think this is a bit of a step too far. Once again, I touched on it earlier on in the show, fighting old sparring partners doesn't always, you know, go very well, doesn't always make for an exciting fight. You tend to know each other inside out quite well. Um, Lawrence Okoli, I think, wins the fight all day long. I don't think there's any danger of him losing the fight. The one thing that I think is probably worth a little punt, though, just if the price is good enough, and I'm just going to check it right now to be sure. Um, Lawrence Ciccoli, I don't know if he's going to want to actually knock out his old, you know, his friend. I'm not sure if he's going to want to knock out his friend. We've seen this many times in the past when two friends have fought each other and they decide, you know, you almost think, hmm, he doesn't seem to be putting everything on these shots. And it's like he doesn't want to knock his friend out. So I would say back in a Coley for the points win might be worth it. A Coley to win on points from what I can see, you can almost quadruple your money. 13 to 5. Hmm. I might jump on that myself. But anyway, all the best to both guys there. Don't really care who wins. Hopefully it's a better fight than I'm expecting between two former sparring partners. Moving now, though, to the Manchester Arena. Um, over here, let's start with the undercard. We're going to see Campbell Hatton, 11-0. He gets in with Michael Bullock, who is 6-2. That's over eight rounds there at super lightweight. Um, elsewhere on that card, we're going to see Akib Fiaz, 11-0. We mentioned him a moment ago. Um, he gets in with Costin Ion, who is 10 and 3 with two draws. That's over eight rounds here at Super Featherweight. Um, I'm expecting Fiaz to win that one on points. Um, and I'm expecting Campbell Hatton. I'm, I'm not too sure with Campbell Hatton. He's fighting a guy who's never been stopped in his two losses. Uh, you just never really know. I guess he's unexposed. Um, moving now to this one as well. Danny Ball, 12-1 and 1 with a draw. It's for the vacant English welterweight title. It's over 10 rounds. He gets in with Jamie Robinson, who's 15-5 and 5 with two draws. I think that might be a decent fight, by the way. Jamie Robinson, never been stopped in his five losses, um, but he's in a bit of good form. He's put together four wins in a row now, and... Um, yeah, Danny Ball, I don't think it's that much of a puncher. I think Danny Ball probably win that one on points. Uh, what else do we have on the card? Uh, Terry Harper, 13-1 and one with a draw. Gets in with Ivana Habazin, who's 21-4, and four, former world champion. It is for Terry's WBA World Super Welterweight title. Obviously, friend of the show is Habazin. I want her to win. She's a friend of mine. I walked her out to the ring, didn't I, in uh, Atlantic City in January 2020 when she boxed Clarissa Shields. Uh, myself and Eddie. Um, yeah, Ivana Habazin um, has only had six days notice for this fight because obviously she was drafted in when Terry Harper didn't get to fight on the Taylor undercard last weekend when when uh, Cecilia Brackhouse pulled out because she had a flu on the night of the, on the on the morning of the fight. So Habazin's only had six rounds. I spoke to her. I said, how long have you had? She said, I've only had six. Sorry, not six rounds. I said, how long have you had notice? She said, I've only had six days, obviously. 
but she said she's really fit. She said, I'm always fit. Like She said this to me over WhatsApp. She said, I'm always fit. I was sparring with Katie Taylor in the build-up to her fight, so I'm really fit. And she's very confident. Um, she's quite tough, Habazin, as well. And um, both of Terry Harper's two wins at this weight at 154 have come on points. So I think it's a distance fight. And I wouldn't be surprised if Terry Harper were to win on points. But I'd love to see Habazin do it. Um, obviously, friend of the show, so all the best to her. Moving up the card once again, Jack Catterall now uh, currently 26-1. and one. He's in a 10-rounder. It's just great to see him back. Obviously, hasn't boxed since getting robbed to Josh Taylor in one of the worst decisions in recent years. Um, so, yes, good to see him back out again after being messed around and all that because that was over a year ago now. He gets in with Dara Foley, who's 22-4 and four with a draw, who got a bit of a... Well, I won't say lucky win because he was winning the fight against Robbie Davies Jr., but Robbie Davies Jr. obviously you know, broke his ankle or whatever in the fight last time. So he holds a win over him. And yeah, that's what's got him the Jack Catterall fight. There's a bit of bad blood there as well. I think Jack Catterall win this one. Just because he's coming off a bit of a layoff, I'm expecting him to probably win on points. Um, I don't think it's going to be much of an eventful fight though. And then, yeah, the main event, Maurizio Lara, the rematch, 26-2 and two with a draw, defending his WBA World Featherweight title against Lee Wood, who's 26-3. and three. It's his 30th pro fight, Lee Wood. Um... I don't think it goes the distance. That's probably my pick here. I think Maurizio Lara has shown, obviously, that he's got the power to knock out Wood. I expected him to knock out Wood the first time round. He got the knockout, even though it didn't look very likely. He was probably losing the fight. Lee Wood, if anything, was looking like the guy who was closer to getting a stoppage, and then he walked into a shot, and that was it. Like the t It just turned like that. One punch changed the fight into Lara's favor, and he got the stoppage. And, yeah, the towel come in, I think it was from... Um, from um, Ben in the corner. So, um, yeah. Uh, I think it's going to be a great fight. It definitely will be a great fight. Um, Lee Wood, I know, has gone away and trained like a madman for this rematch, and rightly so. Mauricio Lara didn't look his old self, though, in the, you know, in the early part of that fight, really up until he got the stoppage. He actually looked quite awful, and it was because he probably hadn't made the weight, I think, for a couple of years. He hadn't actually made the weight. So he didn't look great. So I'm a little bit unsure of what I think is going to happen. I don't think it goes a distance. Like I say, that's my pick. But I'm not entirely sure who's going to win the fight by KO, you know? Um, Lee Wood is about, I think, God, when I, I, I bet on it the other day, actually, and the odds were crazy. Um, I'm not entirely sure they're going to still be the same, but Lee Wood to win by knockout was 15 to 2, which is incredible. Uh, and, and Lara, I can't remember what his odds were, but I think we're going to see a knockout here. Um, just trying to think. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard because Lara looked awful and then he got the knockout. Lee Wood looked really good, but then he got knocked out. Here's the second fight. Can Lara look better than he did in those earlier rounds? Can Lee Wood look better and even more dominant than he did in those earlier rounds? Will, will his powers of recovery be slightly better? I don't know. I just don't think we're going to see 12 full rounds. But anyway, got to move on a bit quicker. Moving now to the SSE Arena in Belfast, Northern Ireland, United Kingdom. Let's start over here with this one. I'm going to really fly through this. Padraig McCrory, 16-0 in a 10-rounder against Diego Ramirez, 25-9 and with a draw. I like watching McCrory. Good fighter. Pierce O'Leary, 11-0. He defends his WBC International Super Lightweight title against Alin Sio Cherry, who I think is probably from Italy with that name. He's 17 and 3. All the best there to Pierce. Moving to this fight now on the undercard. Anthony Kakachi, 20 and 1. He gets in there with Damian Rosensky, who's 26 and 2 with two draws. It's for the IBO World Super Featherweight title, which I think belongs to Kakachi. Um, one thing I want to point out about the opponent, the Polish Rosinski. In his last fight, he boxed a guy called Art Joms Ramlavs, who's 15-1. and one, But Rosinski got dropped there in round five, but managed to get back up and win um, very, very closely by one point on two cards and by three points on the other card. But very, very close considering he also got knocked down. Well, Art Joms Ramlavs, the one loss on his 15-1 and one record was to Archie Sharp. So... So I just wanted to point that out there that this guy got dropped and scraped a points decision, you know, over a guy that Archie Sharp beat a few years ago. Um, 
Moving up the card, uh, I'm expecting Kakachi to win that one probably on points, by the way. Moving up the card, we're going to see the very, very exciting Nick Ball, 17-0, get in there with Ladumo Lamarty, who's 21-0 with a draw. I always like watching Nick Ball. I think he's very, very exciting, especially down at the lower weights. It's, it's hard, really, to find an exciting fighter some of the time, but... Yeah, he gets in with Lamarty, who's from South Africa, 31 years of age. Um, he's been around the scene for a while. He's been kind of, I think, calling out for big fights. Hasn't managed to get any. He's been a pro almost 10 years as well, you know. So this will be his biggest, I guess, test, really. Um, all the best, of course, to Nick Ball. Not entirely sure he's going to get the stoppage, but it should be a good one. And then, yeah, the main event, Luis, Lope, Luis Alberto Lopez, 27-2, and two, the IBF World Featherweight Champion. Obviously, people know him for his fights against Isaac Lowe, Andy Vences, Ruben Villa, Josh Warrington last time out where he was able to beat him and a couple of others. And, yeah, he gets in with Michael Conlon, 18-1. and one. Can Michael Conlon finally do it, finally become world champion? We're going to have to wait and see. It's over 12 rounds. Michael Conlon, I think, goes in as, if I'm not mistaken, the slight favourite, I think. Um, I want to just confirm that. Yeah, he is. He's a slight favourite, 8 to 11, whereas Luis Alberto Lopez, 11 to 10. Interesting, really, because I would have made Lopez probably the favourite. Um, I can see Lopez stopping Conlon. I can see Conlon possibly outboxing Lopez. I don't think Conlon will stop Lopez, that's for sure. So for me, it's either going to be a Lopez win. I, I guess really he could win by by either way, really. But um, yeah, Conlon, I think his only chance is to win on points. He's going to have to box smart. You know, if he got knocked out by Lee Wood, he can certainly get knocked out by Luis Alberto Lopez. Um, but yeah, it's now or never, I think, for Michael Conlon. And I know that that sounds extremely early to, to say that, but that that fight with with Lee Wood was a bit of a war. I think Conlon's had a couple of tough fights. I remember his fight with um, with uh, oh, what's his name um, Baluta. I think Baluta gave him a really really tough fight as well. He's been in a couple of tough fights. Uh, I don't remember the TJ Doheny one being too tough, but you know he's been he's been he's he's got quite a few miles on the clock. I think just for a guy who's only had nineteen fights. So I think he's, you know, he has to win this fight, in my opinion. All the best to him. We've got nothing against Michael Conlon. Moving out now, and it's, it's been rough times as well for Irish fighters. And moving out now to the final card to mention. It takes place at the Fantasy Springs Casino in Indio, California, USA over here. It's going to be live on the zone. It's an Oscar De La Hoya Golden Boy Promotions card. Just one real fight to mention worth no, uh, worth worth mentioning. And that's Alexis Rocha, 22 and one. He gets in there with Anthony Young, who's 24 and two. Um, I can't say I've seen Anthony Young fight before. I'm just having a look at the record now, coming off quite a long winning streak. Um, losses to uh, wow, lo a loss back in 2014 to a guy who was six and three. A loss in 2016 to a guy who was eight and one. He has beaten Saddam Ali. That was back in 2019. I think Ali was probably finished by then. Um, yeah, he hasn't boxed since then, Saddam Ali. Um, that would have, I'm sure, been a big upset. He got him out there in just three rounds. That's probably what he's kind of built his career around, actually, that win. But yeah, he gets in with Alexis Rocha. I'm expecting Rocha to have too much for him. It's it's not really a fight I'm looking forward to. I'm probably not even going to bother tuning into the zone for that fight there. But that is it, though. That wraps up the preview part of the show. In part one, we did the review part. Then we welcomed our special guest, Regis Progray. In part two, we did the news and the preview part. The final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, <laughs> which I'll be doing in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 397 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge shout out to this week's special guest, the reigning WBC super lightweight world champion, Mr. Regis Progre. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. Thanks once again for tuning in. There has been one piece of news break, though, whilst we've been recording the show, and that's that on August the 19th, we're going to see Artabatur defend his light heavyweight crown against 
the UK's Callum Smith, friend of the show, Callum Smith. Cannot wait for that fight there. It's going to be fantastic. It's obviously for the WBC, WBO and IBF light heavyweight titles. Again, the date for that, August 19th in Quebec City, Canada. All the best to Mundo out there in Canada. But that's about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe and we shall see you all again next week.